pleasure to be here and get to talk to you a bit about um, uh, basically biomarker discovery, bringing it all home after doing all this microbiome analysis. And I want to do a special thank you to Anna, Maria, Kristen, uh, Mike, and Thea, of course, here, and John Parkinson for making our version of these, um, uh, many of these slides. Uh, today, what we're going to do basically is go and appreciate, you know, what are biomarkers and their utility, know some biomarkers basics regarding how you identify biomarkers, be aware of some examples, and I'll highlight a case study of biomarkers that we identified from some microbiome data um, with a couple of different approaches, and then appreciate, uh, and I can't emphasize this enough, the importance of careful conservative analysis. So I'll, I'll be really emphasizing that in particular at the end. <clears throat> Okay, so what are biomarkers? So a uh, common definition is they are a measure, measurable biological property that can be indicative of some phenomena, such as an infection, disease, environmental disturbance. Um, essentially, they're a marker of some sort of biology. Um, there is uh, an appreciation in microbiome analysis that there really are two main types. There's sort of functional biomarkers, where you're looking at biological functions, be genes or proteins or even metabolites. that are specific to an organism or even a group of organisms, community organisms that share a certain functional biomarker. Or you can have taxonomic biomarkers are very popular, particularly with the, when you have 60-ness or sort of... Um, more um, amplicon-based analyses, you can have uh, things that are specific to a certain species or a taxa, an OTU, uh, or other kind of grouping of organisms. Now, uh, why we identify biomarkers is, is actually um, for a few different reasons. You know, it can be for detecting in the environment, diagnosing clinically, uh, phenotype more quickly, um, doing it more cheaply and more accurately versus metagenomic sequencing. So when you do <clears throat> whole microbiome sequencing, you sort of have this noise of all these other organisms that are in there that might be varying more sporadically. And, uh, and really what you often want to do is find those key ones that are changing in response to a certain perturbation. And being able to narrow in on those and have something like a simple PCR-based test is really valuable. And um, centers like the BC Center for Disease Control that uh, uh, Will works at, um, you know, they've moved a lot of um, microbial tests from, you know, the, the traditional culturing-based test to PCR-based tests because you can do it very rapidly, high throughput, cheaply, uh, and uh, certainly there's a lot of interest in moving um, metagenomics analyses towards biomarker uh, discovery and biomarkers that you can actually use as a, a clinical test. <clears throat> there's also a growing interest in what we call bugs as drugs, you know, the idea of finding cocktails of microbes that might be used actually in therapeutics. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in this uh, because uh, traditionally people find drugs and then they have to patent those. Uh, but there's a lot of interest in whether and a lot of debate about what happens with microbes. Are they actually a drug or are they actually a tissue and you're sort of doing a tissue transplantation. If you do a treatment as a tissue transplantation of giving somebody some gut microbes, and the idea is your gut microbe is sort of, uh, microbiome is sort of acting like an organ, that, you know, maybe putting those microbes in is actually sort of like a transplant, and therefore it's not subject to the same rules as drug, um, as drugs are. So there is sort of a lot of um, interest in this idea of finding these cocktails of microbes that may or may not be subject to the rules of, of drugs. And there's a growing success stories. Uh, one to highlight here from UBC is an, um, analysis uh, led by uh, Mary Claire Arietta and um, uh, involving um, Stuart Turvey and Brett Finley's group here in, in B BC, UBC. And uh, essentially what they did is, is something, instead of finding some bacteria that were um, higher in some group, they were actually finding things that were missing. So they looked at asthmatic children versus non-asthmatic children and found in these asthmatic children there were certain bacterial species that were lower or missing in those asthmatic children. In these first uh, their children, that, they basically there was this what they call gut microbiome dysbiosis um, that was occurring in these um, infants. And then uh, what they found is if they took the gut microbiome from these asthmatic children, which are considered like unhealthy microbiome leading to development of asthma, and they put that in germ-free mice, and then they put another set of germ-free mice with that same gut microbiome supplemented with these four missing bacteria, uh, bacterial taxa, they actually had reduced inflammation and measures of 
asthma in these mice. So they were able to basically find possible bacteria that could act as some sort of therapeutic or, uh, you know, or maybe even just these could be act as diagnostics for indicating um, asthma and possibly prevention of asthma. I mean, these are very early days with microbiome analysis, and as you probably know, Jonathan Eisen, have you talked about the uh, overselling the microbiome award that they have, uh, so that, uh, that he has? So there's a lot of issues with trying to move too quickly to biomarkers, but there has been a lot of interest in this, uh, you know, in the bowel. There's interest in, I'm involved in a project, uh, well, sorry, I'm a, on the scientific advisory board of a project which is differentiating inflammatory bowel disease from related diseases and detecting degree of severity of inflammatory disease <coughs> using microbiome analysis, basically, excuse me, <coughs> and, and developing, finding um, PCR-based tests that basically can help them in the clinic detect if this patient needs more um, intensive therapy or uh, monitoring versus another patient. Uh, detecting colorectal cancer is another example, and in lungs there's progression of um, COPD uh, that where there's been biomarkers that have been identified. And I apologize, I meant to put um, references here for these uh, this work, but I, I forgot. So if you ha if there's anything you're interested in, just send me a message and I can. Um, you know, follow up with any references, but, but, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, a great stat from an allergen conference that happened here a couple of weeks ago, uh, that one third of adults with asthma are basically don't have asthma. They're being improperly treated. There's a lot of misdiagnosis where people think somebody has breathing issues and then they diagnose asthma, give them a ventilator and they're walking around with this ventilator paying all this money for something that actually they, but they actually have something more serious like COPD or other diseases. So there's a lot of interest in finding these markers, making sure we have more appropriate treatment. Um, even things like in the breast, there's a lot of microbiome analysis identifying markers uh, protecting against um, mastitis. Um, and uh, at the um, <clears throat> and I'll talk about this a bit more as a, in this case study. There's also environmental markers looking at say markers of pollution or conversely ecosystem health. So, uh, you know, I don't know what's wrong with that line there. Um, so what is biomarker selection? So basically it's the process of removing the non-informative uh, sequences. Again, there's this noise of all this information. And absolutely doing metagenomics analysis directly to, to, to investigate something is still very valuable. But, but being able to remove those non-informative or redundant ones and identifying those things that are truly differential between two conditions is of high interest. So how do we find biomarkers? So uh, basically there's software that, uh, as you've already learned about some of it, you know, take the raw digitized information, performing QC, and then you can do quanti quantification of different sequences, you know, based on taxa or genes. And then you're basically using math, there's statistical methods to basically find these markers, and we'll go over that a bit. Uh, and then there's another key component, of course, is validation. So you basically, usually, I've got this sort of, this is more for a non biological audience. Most of you guys will know what primers are, but basically you design primers or these sort of biological hooks that pick up the marker sequences. And then you can use key, key qPCR or quantitative P PCR basically to measure how many times these primers manage to snag your biomarker of interest. And, and really it's all about, you know, using that sort of bioinformatics analysis, the, the math, uh, statistics, and then doing that validation is really the whole uh, biomarker process. Uh, again, um, you know, there's this concept of biomarkers involved the sort of bio and the mark, and really one of the key components of finding biomarkers is that initial analysis plan, that initial design of your experiment is critical. Uh, you know, which, what biology are you looking at? What kind of measures are you making? Absolutely critical to make sure those measures are appropriate. You know, is it really um, looking at these patients and these patients, are they really going to adequately differentiate? Do you possibly have it's these patients and these patients to be stratified into multiple groups or not, for example? Uh, and then the other thing is the marker, you know, uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, you know, of whether you want what do you want to look at taxa or genes or you know viruses or bacteria. Uh, but uh, then, of course, uh, you know, with that good design, uh, then you obtain your biological samples, you extract and sequence your DNA. Um, identify your markers, and I'm going to talk about this. Uh, uh, 
basically finding those taxa, OTUs, or functional genes more or less abundant in your test versus control. And then you're validating these markers, both in silico usually at first and then in vitro uh, or in the lab. And then iteratively, you're further optimizing those biomarkers. So these are the bits that I'm going to sort of focus on here. But I will mention a bit about the, you know, the, the marker kind of concept and the bio concept. I mean, there's often this issue of, you know, what do you want to look at? Do you want to look at bacteria, viruses, eukaryotes? Um, and so just some big picture comments just to remind you is that, you know, for bacteria, you know, you can do shotgun or 16S amplicon. There's certainly the best study, the best richest databases of information, most methods developed. So there's a lot of pluses for that. Viruses, though, um, where you use shotgun or amplicon, there's this RDRP or G23 um, markers that you can use uh, for doing a virus analysis. I mean, it can be really challenging to get enough DNA and get the quality DNA, um, and uh, it can be messy, to put it mildly, as Thea has learned <laughs> doing some uh, viral analysis. But I have to say, um, uh, we've got interesting data showing the value of looking at bacteria and viruses, which can include phage. Uh, and this concept of population bursts or changes that might occur that might not be better as well measured at the bacterial level. So, uh, you know, I really want to emphasize this concept of that in the future, combinations might become more and more uh, valuable and, and looking at these in combination. For eukaryotes, it's still early days. There's sort of amplicon analysis either by looking at the 18S R, um, ribosomal RNA, of course, which is different from the 16S in eukaryotes, or the ITS sequences. Um, there's been some nice uh, development of that, but uh, we don't really do shotgun because genomes are so large. It's really co um, cost prohibitive. Uh, and there is, it is well studied, you know, and many methods developed, but not as much as bacteria. So it's still the, the majority of analyses are still focusing on bacteria. But I can't emphasize enough that when you're doing an analysis, you know, do consider looking at bacteria, viruses, and eukaryotes because you can probably get... Um, um, some interesting uh, results that might be more robust in those with, by using those combinations, or at least at minimum, it would be good to look at it to see if you could find something that is uh, more valuable. Uh, so the uh, issue, of course, of marker, uh, you know, you've got that bio, but uh, the marker that you want, you sort of look, as you know, you can sort of look at taxonomic analysis and just sort of, I'm assuming this is a bit of a review, that, you know, uh, sort of there's this problem with them. Um, taxonomic level analysis that that sort of strain level diversity can cause some issues. Um, it can be more variable across environments. Uh, I'm going to talk about some environmental analysis where you may be looking at one body of water and you might get a marker of a certain tax in that body of water, but another body of marker has a body of water with a different marker. So, uh, you know, this kind of concept of variability in taxa can be problematic. Uh, with gene-based analyses, they're, they're also uh, really desired, but, uh, and that's where you get the sure shotgun metagenomics data. Um, but you do need good sequencing depth to, to reach some genes. And I would say uh, the biggest issue is we don't have enough knowledge of some genes, so there's sort of this issue of what knowledge there is. And, um, <clears throat> and, in, and of course, the cost of uh, doing metagenomics versus, uh, say, 16S amplicon analysis. Uh, we've... We've had a lot of success with doing both, and then um, one thing I have to say in the future I'll be more and more interested in is using something like a amplicon marker analysis as initial screen for giving you a sense of how the data is varying and what's going on, and then targeting certain samples for your more in-depth metagenomics analysis uh, to get at that community um, and the gene variability that's occurring that you miss in, uh, say, 16S. Uh, don't forget about other markers. Uh, there's sort of looking just simply at microbial diversity. Not a big fan of it, but it has been surprisingly useful, again, to get a feel for how your community is changing over time. And then also using microbial analysis that, to suggest other metabolic markers. There's a lot of interest in using meta, um, metabolomics and, and using this to derive um, some future metabolomic studies as well. Um, but again, you know, combinations can be really valuable. Okay, what makes a good biomarker? So uh, basically, you're really wanting things that are going to be differential, okay? So, you know, some basic uh, statistics that, you know, you might have your sort of abundance and your sort of frequency in your sample of, say, OTU1. You really want these means to be far apart. You don't want them to be overlapping, say, for this 
OTU1, OTU2. You basically want to have um, very different abundance. Um, uh, the means should be far apart, and also the variance should be low. I mean, you really want it to be that in a given sample, you're going to have that big abundance. It's not going to be that some samples are going to be it's more abundant than others. Okay, uh, this might be a better way to show it. Uh, so here's just a sort of schematic example, pseudo example of say we want to find biomarkers that separate the red and the blue. So we'll say the blue are the uh, healthy people and the red or the unhealthy people or something. And so, um, you know, you can basically look at these OTU1, OTU2, OTU3, and obviously OTU1 looks really great because, look, it's present in 1, 2, and 4 and not present in 3 and 5, uh, where or depending on how you're looking at it. And then, uh, but you can see how OTU2 is cer certainly more inconsistent uh, and uh, really is not a good marker. And then OTU3, of course, is not useful at all because it's present in all of them. So again, uh, really what you want is those things that are going to be uh, differentiating with a clear difference and a consistent um, abundance. Uh, so in terms of um, uh, the math, of once you get those abundances, you can basically range from the very simple, like a simple t-test, to more complex. You can write your own analyses using our equivalent, or you can use methods developed by others. Um, and uh, I think I pronounce it lefc, but I don't know what people call it. But do you call it lefc? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you know, it's been implemented basically as a nice, convenient Galaxy workflow. So uh, have you guys talked about Galaxy much? I don't think so. But Galaxy is it just nice um, uh, workflow? If you're not familiar, I'm not going to get into it right now. But if you're not familiar with Galaxy, I recommend you get familiar with it because it's a really nice uh, a way to sort of link a bunch of analyses together and do a workflow for doing a bunch of analyses. And particularly if you don't have uh, strong computational skills, but uh, but basically it's implemented as convenient Galaxy workflow. There's also meta genome seek that's been implemented using R. Uh, just to focus in on Let's see just a bit. I mean, um, I don't really have time to go into a lot of detail here, but just say it's it's really for sort of very high dimensional biomarker discovery um, and explanation. It, it basically IDs this these features, genes or pathways or taxa that differentiate classes between two or more uh, biological conditions or classes. And basically, first it statistically looks at different features among these biological classes. Um, using this uh, non-parametric um, uh, factorial KW sum rank test. Don't worry about that. I'm not going to get into statistics, but I will say that uh, what's nice is then it performs pairwise tests among these subclasses using this unpaired Wilcon Wilcoxon um, test to basically to assess if there's differences consistent with this expected biological behavior. So it's finding these differences in the classes and then it performs these tests among some subclasses to see if you still get that um, differences are consistent with re um, respect to that uh, expected uh, behavior. And then it uses this um, LDA or linear discriminant analysis to estimate the effect size of each of these differential abundant features using a dimensional reduction if needed. And this is a nice image that um, uh, basically, you know, this concept that you can have your data where you already have your um, analysis uh, partly complete uh, and you can go right to the left C or you might sort of have your high throughput experiments and do you want to do your taxon abundances, your functional abundances, your gene expression analysis. But basically you're feeding that into left C and then you've also got maybe some prior knowledge that uh, you know, based on things like keg and go and seed, uh, these, you know, keg uh, functional pathway or basically pathway database, etc., that feeds in. And um, essentially, it does analysis that I described before, where you end up with this um, a couple of different analyses or visualizations. You can get visualization of different features ranked by that effect size. You know, as as determined, or you can get representations of features on taxonomic or phylogenetic trees, or plots, statistically different conditions, and um, essentially it tries to be like a nice little all-in-one package for doing these analyses. But um, I'm not going to go into it in detail, and I've got a web link here that you can get a lot more information. I encourage you, if you're interested in this method, to go into it in more detail and read about it. Make sure you understand it. Make sure it's appropriate for yours, because. And I can't emphasize, emphasize this enough that biomarker selection require, um, relies on statistical, 
techniques it's really important you and understand your methods that you're using particularly um, make sure um, you understand your assumptions of the data statistical methods assumptions of the data is assuming a normal distribution or not so you should know is your data normally distributed or not um, statistical methods limitations and how to interpret your result from the output so uh, you know basically you must choose but choose wisely you know uh, but uh, it really depends on your research so I'm going to go through a couple of things and then get to this case study to help illustrate that so uh, considerations are uh, do you have discrete or categorical data or do you have continuous variables um, or do, you, do your samples involve known classes or do you not know how many classes there are? Uh, so generally um, you try to predict labels or um, you know you have classification as these sort of um, uh, class A, class B or you might have continuous variables um, you know, sadly, I was sort of smiling at this this morning, uh, or grimacing, because, uh, you, know, uh, you know, obviously, when you're doing continuous variables, um, you would have linear regression, and which attempts to, say, to predict some future value for some variable. So a common example would be attempting to predict tomorrow's stock prices, which has become really important, actually, today, in light of what's happened over the last 24 hours. But, uh, uh, but basically, the concept is that... Um, uh, if you have categorical data, um, you would be doing something like logistical regression, and if you have more um, continuous data, you'd be doing linear regression. And I should, um, oops, I went forward here. I guess I'll go into that. So uh, you also have another issue of whether you want to do a supervised or unsupervised approach. That is, do your samples have known classes? Do you already know that you've got, these are your healthy patients and these are your disease patients, and you absolutely know what those are? Or do you actually have a bunch of data where um, you would like to learn, you know, how many different groupings are there, you know, what have, you know, what is happening in my community and what, what um, uh, how many different classes are there? Is there actually uh, a group of patients that are um, unaffected and then there's patients that are um, affected but have this kind of profile and then other patients that are affected and have this other kind of profile. So, uh, so this concept of doing supervised versus unsupervised analysis um, it comes into play. So again, supervised analysis where you have samples come from known classes and you basically, like as in this example here, you would know that say sample 3 and sample 5 are from one class and 1, 2, and 4 are from a different class. Whereas unsupervised, and then you evaluate it using this test set. And then unsupervised are basically when you don't know the classes and you want to discover. So basically you have all these samples and you discover, say, that sample three and sample five are in one class and one, two, and three are the other class. And so you're let, really letting the data drive the discovery. And I, I should say that there's generally these two categories, but you can also have semi-supervised methods uh, as well. But just to mention... Um, the advantages of supervised, obviously, really easy to do. It's simpler because, uh, and also you can find biomarkers that may be more robust and relevant because you've clearly said, this is one class, this is the other class. Give me the, th the biomarkers that are different between those. And it's really easy to validate because you sort of know what your classes are. But the dis disadvantages, you do have to remember those classes may not be well-defined, and this comes back to that... Um, you know, design of your experiment. I mean, if you're looking at sort of some positives and negatives, what if your negatives have a lot of um, issues or, it, you know, if there's actually a subclass there or your positives might have different kinds of degrees of severity and those different degrees of severity may have different um, uh, biological factors driving those, those uh, different degrees of severity. So it just, uh, you know, you have to be very careful. You also might have sort of a continuous kind of situation. So uh, where, you know, what you define as sort of affected versus unaffected is a bit, um, there's a, a gray area. So it's really, uh, can be defined, um, can be uh, a problematic sometimes doing supervised. Uh, but generally, if you can do it, it's always good to do. But an advantage of unsupervised is it doesn't assume anything, right? So you can really find novel things about your data, and you can basically, <clears throat> well, it can be just um, difficult to evaluate and can require a lot of, you need sort of more samples to get robust analysis to find these different classes 
Uh, and so that can make it more computation intensive. I mean, there's huge value in being able to look at your data and seeing what the data says regarding classes, because you might find, as some people do, that your people who are affected, you know, like we used to talk, talk about cancers, and then we learned that there's actually many cancers that have the sort of same phenotype, but some different uh, genotypes, for example. So uh, how do we validate these biomarkers? So I, I mean, I, I guess I'll just, just to close with that, um, I'll come back to sort of um, in our case study what we did. But just keep in mind that you're always sort of trying to think of that study design when you do biomarkers. Think of, you know, am I looking at sort of discrete or continuous variables? Am I looking at wanting to do sort of supervised or semi-supervised analyses? These are the kinds of considerations you want to look at. Um, whether you have uh, uh, investigating whether you have a normal distribution in your data or not, for example. Anyway, so how do we validate our biomarkers? So once you ID uh, a group and you want to use it as a biomarker, you obviously need to get it, make a test. So PCR or qPCR is a good option. And uh, one approach that um, I'll show you an example of is using sort of a marker-based tool like Metaflan 2 that you've learned about. Or you can, um, that basically you already have the marker there. Or you can cluster reads and align them to find conserved sequences and verify that that representative sort of consensus sequence or conserved sequences, uh, I should say representative sequence rather than um, consensus, but is selective. And then you can also, then of course, once you find those actual sequences uh, that are associated as a good biomarker, then you want to design primers, basically using primer prospector, or primer blast, or two popular methods, where you can design primers from a sequence alignment or design primers specific to a, play, a clade that allow you to basically find those primers to do that PCR. But uh, let's get into a case study to sort of illustrate uh, how this uh, works. So this uh, analysis is, uh, this, there's watersheddiscovery.ca for more information. It's a Genome Canada funded uh, um, <clears throat> watershed metagenomics project. And really the idea was, uh, uh, oh, I should just mention, I'll mention more about the idea in a second. But um, basically we're doing improved pollution and pathogen detection, source tracking using metagenomics to identify markers of water quality. <clears throat> and I need my water. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge in particular Thea and Mike here who uh, were involved in this study and I did this strategically. So if you have any really picky details, I'm going to point them to these guys because they're the ones who actually did the work. So, and Will, I should mention, but uh, uh, you know. Um, I didn't do the work. <laughs> he, he's, he, he'll, he'll be the driver of the intellectual comment, commentary. <laughs> uh, not that you guys wouldn't. Sorry. Oh, boy. Insert mouth and, <laughs> insert mouth and foot. That's not a good uh, thing. Okay. I have not had much sleep over the last 48 hours. Okay, so um, uh, basically, uh, I, I would just really like to acknowledge also Patrick Tang, who uh, was sort of the PI who led this project. Uh, and Matthew Croxon um, and others, Miguel and uh, Natalie here, uh, they're basically all associated with the BCCDC, um, um, UBC Genome Science Center, and uh, at SFU. Uh, so the idea, though, is why do we care about watershed metagenomics? So basically, we wanted to use a more ecosystem approach to water quality monitoring. So the current emphasis of water quality testing is really at the tap, and we wanted to look more at the source. So when we have problems with water quality, it makes much more sense to find the source of that problem and stop that problem rather than just putting dumping a bunch of chemicals and trying to clean our water. Um, we have big problems in BC, for example, with 20, you know, 24/7 boil water advisories in some communities because they haven't identified this or or haven't uh, just don't have access to clean water. Uh, another big problem is coliform tests. You've heard about beaches getting. Uh, closed for high coliform counts. Well, coliform test is really inaccurate. Uh, it <clears throat> can identify the source. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, it's important to realize that um, for coliforms, that coliforms are a type of bacteria of which not all coliforms are pathogens. So you could close a beach because of a high coliform count and it just might not be actually going to make you sick. Um, the other thing is you can um, also not all pathogens are coliforms. There's protists and other organisms that can be pathogens. So you could actually have a low coliform count, but actually have water that can make you sick. So really, the, the, the concept was to do an analysis of clean and, and dirty uh, water, compare them, find better meta, uh, markers based on metagenomic surveys, 
um, where we could do a PCR-based test of a panel of microbes to basically identify water, um, water quality more robustly. So to do this, the case study design was we basically had a control watershed of some clean water in Victoria. So anybody associated with Victoria, your water is actually really nice and clean. Um, then we also had a human impacted watershed, uh, looking at uh, water where there was impact from leaking septic tanks into the water. And then agriculturally impacted uh, watershed, uh, co collecting samples over the course of a year, plus additional um, like monthly samples, plus additional hourly time courses, um, filtering the microbes, doing sequencing of uh, microbial DNA and viral RNA, <clears throat> doing 16S, 18S for eukaryote, CPN60, um, uh, and shotgun sequence, um, and then basically doing bioinformatics analysis uh, and biomarker identification, most notably. So this, uh, I'm going to focus in on the agricultural <coughs> watershed, where we had one sampling site upstream of the contamination and two downstream, and um, one sort of at the site and one sort of uh, more downstream. And basically, we had these um, samples where we just did a microbiome survey, both taxon and gene profiles, looked at differential differential features, and the idea is to develop a qPCR test. So um, I'm going to bring up two approaches used. Um, one uh, was a sort of fast track approach to sort of marker ID um, that actually was done by Thea. And so um, uh, basically using Metaflan. And the idea is Metaflan, um, you know, has really high precision. It, you know, when you find something, it's probably right but it has low sensitivity, so it's, it's missing a lot. You know, it'll find some things, so it's good for just doing a quick pass, fast track, it'll, if it finds stuff, that's wonderful, because you've got some stuff that's probably good, but it's gonna miss lots of things, right? So if you don't find anything, that doesn't mean you don't have good markers there. But uh, certainly, uh, we have found Metaflan really useful to get a quick pass uh, look at, at what your data is like, and uh, essentially based on um, select clade-specific gene sequences, and uh, note there's about uh, 3,000 reference genomes. That must be higher now, though, isn't yeah, it? Like, yeah, we should get that updated. And uh, and basically, it's fast, though. You can do analysis really fast. So uh, essentially, step one is you sort of process and validate the data, quality trim, normalize your data, cross samples. Um, and I'll emphasize this a couple of times, this concept that we found it really useful having this sort of mock community or positive control validation. So basically, you take a bunch of DNA from a bunch of different microbes, put them in some sterile distilled deionized water or, de or de even deionized water, and you basically sequence that. And that acts as a really useful bioinformatics and, and lab-based control, uh, a sequencing-based control to check that your sequence quality is okay. So you should be able to, like if you put in four bacteria, you should get those four bacteria to come out and it, it'll really help with evaluating um, your data and doing analyses. So this, this mock community, I can't emphasize enough that this is not done enough in microbiome analysis. And I really encourage any of you doing microbiome analyses, please use a positive control. It's going to become more and more required. I'm getting really distracted by these cute little kids walking by, but uh, my kids are getting older. I'm like, oh, they're so cute. I, I've forgotten how much work they are. Uh, but uh, anyways, um, so uh, note a couple of things here uh, that when uh, Thea did the analysis, only 7% of the reads right, were assigned to Metaflan, uh, assigned by Metaflan to a species. So this was expected. I mean, there's low sensitivity. It's a fast, precise approach. Of those, 84% were correctly assigned, which is pretty good. Um, but keep in mind, this is water microbiome, which is, we don't know as much about this. So um, uh, certainly for a gut microbiome, uh, where it's better, generally our, the human gut microbiome bacteria are more characterized and in more in databases. And so you can get a bit of better accuracy uh, for say, versus, say, something like looking at some water where it's uh, a lot of species that maybe haven't been looked at before. But in short, uh, I just want to make sure you realize that so we're analyzing these markers but we're only doing it on seven percent of the data right so you're, you can find something but you are finding it from a subset of the data but uh, but she was able to identify something and <clears throat> so like just for purposes of simplicity and also because we're not apparently because of possible um, uh, IP, we can't mention what the taxa are, but uh, but basically it's, uh, you know, you can see there's this taxon one that's um, 
uh, differential uh, between this upstream um, sequences and at the site or downstream of sequences and also uh, taxon 2 here. And uh, I should note that we prioritized highly abundant taxa with the idea that you don't want to be finding markers that are something that's really, really rare because that's going to be hard to find a test. You know, you, you don't want to have to collect 50 liters of water to make a test, right? You want to collect that little teeny tiny bit of water to do a PCR-based test. Um, used a White's non-parametric t-test with false discovery rate, uh, multiple test correction to find these differential um, abundant taxa because uh, she did look at the data and saw that it was um, uh, not normal distribution, so that's when you want to use a non-parametric test. Uh, and I'll just note here that random forest is something that she's also done. Um, uh, uh, in general, uh, is also a really nice test to consider. It has some built-in validation that's really nice, so just uh, another method or approach to consider. Uh, but uh, basically, um, so you get that, so of that um, data, just appreciate that 57,000 reads were assigned to taxon 1 and about 2,000 assigned taxon 2. So prioritize taxon 1 due to this interest in having more abundant uh, taxa. And then, um, and this is the key part here, so you basically have those reads that you basically have, and then you extract taxon-specific sequences from Metaflan database. So in this case, we've got 607 uh, sequences for taxon 1. And then what you want to do is assign those reads. So you basically against those sequences. So you've got these taxon-specific sequences, assign those reads against those sequences, and then choose those uh, uh, regions of Metaflan sequences that have the most hits. So here's an attempt to show it sort of as a fake sort of schematic diagram. So maybe you have a Metaflan se marker sequence. And then you have maybe a consensus sequence of all these reads aligning. And, um, but then you have this highest coverage area, right? And so that would be your candidate marker sequence that you'd be interested in. So then what she did is collected those sequences, these candidate marker sequences, and then used primer 3 for primer and probe design for basically to PCR up those sequences. And then the first thing, of course, you want to do, absolutely critical, is just check in silico if you can just do that against your sequences. Can you actually... Uh, PCR up, quote, in silico, uh, these, um, this expected marker sequence. And um, note, um, in this particular analysis, considered matches that are exact or have one to two mismatches to handle a little bit of uh, variability. There is a bit of an issue that ideally you want to be able to have mismatches be positioned, you know, because the way PCR works, there's a difference between how the three prime end of the primers versus the five prime end of the primer. Happy to talk about that more if needed. But uh, unfortunately, there's a bit of an issue with we don't have any perfect primer making method, right, that does this really well and does everything you need uh, really well. There's a need for software actually in this area. But uh, uh, the idea is then you choose sequences that minimize nonspecific matches. And certainly, you know, here's just, this is just showing in silico, but uh, you can see sort of at the site and downstream, um, you're getting all these uh, amplicons with the, 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 the sort of forward primer and then this probe, and then there's the reverse prime, uh, sorry, and the reverse primer, and this is upstream, and you can see you're not getting your sequences. So you're getting your sequences showing up, as you would expect, um, at the site and downstream. And most importantly, we have confirmed in the lab we can amplify a product of the right size, so that's great. Uh, but I have to say, uh, just a few comments, you know, um, this is being used to sort of pilot an iterative validation process where you'd look at a bunch of markers, um, you'd go back and look at a whole bunch of uh, possible um, uh, sequences or taxa, um, look at a bunch of, identify a bunch of possible markers, identify a bunch of possible primers, because usually the way things work is that, you know, if you ever have any experience developing primers against something, you're always going to have a, just a certain level of failure rate of computationally the primers seem to work, but when you actually do them in the lab, they don't, right? So you've got to basically have that nice cohort of a bunch of possible cases, and then you're going to whittle that down into your final sort of hopefully your uh, PCR-based test that's actually going to work. Um, benefits of this approach really are it's fast, and the sequence data to PCR primers just takes a couple of days, so you can get something quick and Inevitably, with most microbial analyses where they're interested in biomarkers, the whole lab analysis and sequencing stuff always takes too long. So by the time you get to the bioinformatics analysis, 
the people who are going to do the downstream validation are desperate to get something to start validating as soon as possible. So this is a way to get something fast to people. But it, and it doesn't require a large amount of processing power, but the, it really does depend on differential abundance of known bacteria. Like it has to be something that's in the Metaflan database. So there's also, remember, I'm only analyzing 7% of that data. So there's a whole bunch of other markers that you're missing. But, um, and it also is based on taxa, which have been shown to be more variable across environments than gene functions. So, uh, you know, it's really is a low hanging fruit, uh, good first step. The second one I'm going to mention is the case study that uh, the basically approach that uh, actually Mike Peabody did, where um, he looked at uh, a sort of more complete analysis. So this is like doing metagenomics analysis, doing actual um, looking at all of the data uh, now. Well, okay, I, I, I correct myself. Looking at more of the data might be the more accurate phrase. And so the idea is um, uh, with... Uh, Kraken or discriminate, um, you can do uh, analysis on the actual metagenomic sequence data. Um, and I'll mention this Peabody paper by him uh, about uh, talking about different methods and how different methods can perform under different conditions. And you might want to look at that uh, to decide what method would be best for you. But then uh, what you can do is you can do gene function analysis, like for example with Megan 4, which uses seed or keg databases uh, basically to do more. Um, uh, functional classification, enable you to find gene-based um, um, uh, analyses that are looking at certain kinds of functional classes, and um, and basically you could do cluster-based analysis. So uh, an example is you ba you basically get predicted proteins, you cluster them, find differential clusters, and design PCR. And I'm just going to go through uh, just in sort of one slide, just over well, just overview of how you would do this. So basically, you have your discriminative taxa or functions that you've already done. And then what you can do is identify an informative region for primer design. You use CD hit to sort of cluster reads by identity. So basically, you have all your reads and you cluster them um, using CD hit. And then what you can do is define, design primers, like using Primer Blast or um, this IDT real-time PCR tool, uh, basically against those uh, uh, clusters. <clears throat> and then validate these primers in silico, like we talked about before, using Primer Prospector or Primer Blast. And sorry, keep hitting that. And then uh, basically you validate your primers in vitro right afterwards. Now, um, that kind of approach, again, I want to just emphasize that that kind of approach allows you to find other markers. So they looked at the same data and, you know, um, Thea found a marker that also might found, but he found a whole bunch of others. So he was able to find other ones that are also being put through the pipeline now for qPCR uh, or PCR validation. Or at least I think they are. They're being validated right now, aren't they? Or I don't know what the status is on that. Yeah, but we'll have to check into that. But, um, anyways, so <clears throat> uh, I can't emphasize enough, though, just to remember other kinds of markers. Community diversity, I used to be sort of like, eh, about it, you know, what's the point? But it really is um, an in <coughs> interesting indicator that can also complement what you're doing for your other analyses. So it's a good idea to look at diversity. Um, and then it might suggest other types of screening tests, like metabolites, etc. And I can't emphasize enough that markers are only good as the data they're based on. So you have to design experiments carefully, including positive and negative controls. And I'm just going to add a couple final comments and reference a couple of papers here that this concept of using controls in experimental design is just basic science, but it's so important for microbiome analyses. There's such a problem right now with people just going in and sequencing stuff and then, uh, you know, without that proper design, you've got to think of what question you're really trying to ask and make sure that your design is appropriate for that question. Um, and also... Um, and, uh, you know, it's, I think, I understand, uh, you know, apologies, I wasn't able to be here for the first couple of days because I was away out of town, but the, um, <clears throat> I understand uh, the issue of negative controls has been brought up, and, you know, I'd like to emphasize that idea of, you know, contamination can really affect microbiome analyses, and there was a really nice paper that came out about uh, just this week, or was tweeted about uh, by Jonathan Allison, <coughs> I can send it, but... Uh, where they uh, were looking at placental samples because there's been a lot of interest in whether there's sort of bacteria that are crossing into the placenta and actually impacting um, uh, the immune system development of, of children, uh, infants, when they're, or what do you call them, 
fetuses uh, when they're in the body, and uh, and basically uh, showed that the because they had the controls that the placental microbiome they were finding was actually no different from the negative control microbiome. So basically, uh, you know, without those controls, you could have easily said, "Oh, look at all those interesting tacks that we're finding in these placenta." And, um, but, uh, but by having those controls, they were able to identify this problem of contamination. And uh, I can't emphasize how important that is. The other issue is noting this variation in accuracy of different metagenomics analysis methods. So this is that paper I mentioned uh, by Mike Peabody that I encourage you to look at just for the purposes of just appreciating, because a lot of people really, um, we got a lot of good feedback about how much People said, you know, they really appreciated the effort that went in to evaluate. You know, it's a lot of work to evaluate all this. And it's not perfect. It's not the only analysis. It's actually in, uh, we had an interesting challenge, by the way, with uh, one to add comments to the paper, but then they, they the, the journal, um, uh, basically BMC Bioinformatics, we just stuck it in, uh, decided to change their uh, journal format and all the comments got lost, I guess. I can't remember what... Did they, they, just, have, they don't allow any new ones. They don't allow any new ones, but I think the did the old ones actually weren't the showing up anymore. Still, they were they, gone, but I think they they put them back. Yeah, because there was, it was a bit of a weird piece. But so we ended up adding a comment because we wanted to add a comment, and because we got a lot of feedback afterwards, and we sort of did a sort of frequently asked questions, you know. And so there's a in the PubMed version of this paper. Check out there's a PubMed sort of. Uh, frequently asked questions that we responded to that have, have people have appreciated that basically just deal with some of the issues. But what I want you to appreciate is that different methods have different levels, like, you know, Metaflan, you know, uh, it really is going to look at a subset of your data. Um, Discriminate is a, is a really good method, but it does sort of a little higher level taxonomic allows. You know, it doesn't go down to the genus and species. And if you want to look at the genus and species um, level uh, or you know, even further, um, you know, that's not the method of choice. So basically, uh, you know, appreciating um, these differences in methods and what the method that would be suitable for your uh, experimental design. So again, this variation in accuracy can be significant. Um, and then appreciate the biases and limitations of what's in the sequence databases. I mean, if you don't have, uh, that's why we found doing the Amplicon analysis and doing the metagenomics analysis really useful because they sort of complement each other. Uh, the Amplicon analysis will find some things that the metagenomics won't, and the metagenomics will find things that the Amplicon analysis won't. And a lot of it has to do with the databases, you know, what's in those databases you're looking at and those sequences. And, uh, and then lastly er, um, is this issue of carefully examining the data, the methods and the biases when you're comparing across different data sets. So there's a lot of interest in trying to integrate different data sets together, but you've got to really watch that... For example, the Amplicon analysis, did they use the V3 region or the V4 region? And uh, how did they process their initial samples? And watch out for biases that can occur. Again, positive controls are so useful for comparing across different um, analyses. So uh, having your positive controls in there will also help people in the future be able to use your data uh, further in um, subsequent analysis. So just, uh, again, careful consider analysis can really uh, pay off and... Um, and uh, I guess I will leave it at that and just see if you guys have any questions. But uh, I would also um, just like to mention, happy to take questions, but we're also what we thought we'd do. How are we for time? Oh, great. We wanted to leave lots of time to go over, um, a, you know, some big picture questions and thoughts you might have. So we're going to sort of start, you know, you can ask me any questions, but we're also going to sort of open it up to the floor of people and have sort of a panel discussion of sorts. Um, to sort of go over some um, questions, and then I have some ideas of things I can use to prompt you, okay? But uh, with that, thank you so much, and I hope you've uh, really enjoyed this uh, workshop. Okay, thank you. That's it. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know what? I'll let uh, Thea answer that. <laughs> Someone uh, who knows the data the best. I suppose, really, you know, could you do that again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, for sure. I think it was so. The, the nice thing about using that meta plan approach is that you you write away, you get the data that you're looking for, and then you can sort of, you know, 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 you can sort of, you know
a, a marker that might be differential between two groups of samples. And for that, it's it's a great uh, it's a great great tool. The when it can be um, not as useful is if you if a lot of the bacteria in your sample are not going to have the marker gene in Metaplan, then the output from Metaplan in terms of a giving you a taxonomic profile of your sample that might be quite off. Um, and I think that's what we saw when we looked at the Metaplan results for the whole like a taxonomic profile for a sample versus a um, sort of similarity uh, search-based approach. Um, then we saw quite a difference, right, between if we're looking at the whole sample and a larger you know, taxonomic profile. But if you're just looking at, you know, is this um, group of bacteria differentially abundant between group uh, you know, samples A, B, and C, and the other samples, um, then that was fine, actually. That, that looked like it um, more carried out, uh, or at least we saw the same thing in our other kinds of analyses as well. Yeah. And I would say, in general, my impression is, but, you know, we haven't done, like, many, many analyses, and you guys might want to comment further, but, you know, you can get a sense of things will be different or the same, you know, like, you can get a bit of a overview of your data uh, from that analysis and very quickly, right? You know, uh, just a very short analysis, not hours. So I don't know, Mike, if you have any thoughts, but I think there's... Yeah, yeah, so basically, just as Steve mentioned, like if your community that you're studying is, has a lot of reference genomes, then it's going to be in the Metaplan database. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, it's going to work great. But if you're like the community knowledge and there's almost no reference genomes, then it's going to give you almost nothing. No, thanks for bringing that up. It's a really important point that there's a dis sort of a difference to factor in whether you're looking at some sort of human gut microbiome analysis that is something that people have looked at a lot, or if you're looking at some sort of strange, you know, Arctic or Antarctic, you know, environment, right? It's going to be a difference in how well those kind of marker-based approaches are going to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's really hard to design the study and then you get criticized for if you didn't use household controls in the context of your question. I don't think it's a totally useless thing to do. I just, I, I would really, I would really value actually a broad discussion on how to select microbial controls in clean studies because I'm obsessed with your microbiome and any microbiome. Yeah, no, it's, you're bringing up a great point. So um, there's two things there. There's sort of like your standardized control can be useful, uh, you know, because then you sort of, people are using it in general, and I could see that point of doing that. But I, I have to say, I really do believe strongly in the idea of using some sort of customized control can also be really nice. You know, if we're doing water microbiome, and we're sort of expecting certain kinds of bacteria to be in there versus, say, a gut microbiome where you're expecting you know, certain bacteria to be in there. I mean, it would make sense for your controls to include some of those bacteria that you're expecting. I mean, why not? So the, the challenge with microbiome analyses, you never really have that true control. You don't have that microbiome that you absolutely know what's in there. You're always sort of spiking bacteria, uh, you know, known bacteria into it. But, but I think there is absolutely, it makes sense to use bacteria that you're expecting to see or or at least reflect a bit um, the level of diversity you're going to see, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I have to say, my bigger concern has just been a lack of, I mean, people just aren't using positive controls, period. You know, I mean, there's been a lot of work published uh, without positive controls. So I would like to just at least see something being used. And I'm not too worried about, I'm, I'm surprised you say that, have you been criticized then for which controls you used? or? Terrible thing to do because you'll never 
know. One has MS and one doesn't. It's, and you know they're different already based on puberty and, and what could be sex and what. So I guess that's where I'm coming from. But where, what is the criticism about that uh, that you're getting? Yeah. See, I would argue, I guess, that, you know, ideally you want to do both, right? You want to address those issues until we have more data. I mean, the fundamental problem right now we have, right, is not enough data. What is it with all these kids going by? I just have to say, it. it's like very distracting. Um, anyways, uh, they're getting younger and younger on campus. Uh, so, um, but basically, seriously, uh, you know, what, um, is, is there a downside to, you know, you know, um, Looking at the household and looking at the—I mean, I, I agree, though, absolutely with what you're saying. But uh, you know, can you look at it in those multiple ways? You know, as a way to—and—and uh, and is it not, not really a sign that we need more data, just more fundamental data on how a household is varying and how people are varying? And and this is what I hope is we will get better data so that we can literally have better controls as a result, right? Yeah. No, I agree yeah. with that. I just, I just Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but it's a big issue. Controls, like from day to day, you might have slight differences in your experimental design that might impact your DNA extraction. So, would you recommend to do controls for your DNA extraction on every day that you're doing it? Well, we had we had batch processing of our samples where we would have a sequencing run and we would have a positive and negative control for the, each sequencing run, and that was really useful because we had one case where we were doing this, you know, these samples over a year, and right before Christmas we had some samples that we like we didn't know this until later when we analyzed the samples, but these samples that were sequenced and, and done right before Christmas had all this contamination showing up, but then it disappeared after Christmas, I guess, because they made new lab reagents, I guess. I don't know. Um, but, uh, uh, but basically, it was very valuable to sort of um, see that temporal, you know, um, change. But, you know, you, you, you don't want to just have one positive or negative control. Absolutely, I think you want to be including them, just like you would any experiment, right? You know, you do have to uh, control for batch differences and, and et cetera. And, and I mean... Uh, you know, they take up space and, you know, resources and stuff, but they really do pay off, I found, anyways. Another uh, question about your fiber design. Um, let's say you identified a marker at the OTU level. Would that be beneficial in terms of, can you use that to design a condom? Yeah. yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, so the nice thing about having an OTU is that you have a representative sequence, right? Labs yesterday, or a few days ago, and uh, and then you can use that representative sequence to design your primers on there. You might, um, if if the. Uh, yeah, actually yeah. there is. Yes, you might also want to um, do an alignment of the reads that are assigned that are to you, just to see if you have any um, sort of positions in the sequence where you have variety. Variability within your reads, um, just and then you can avoid sort of that section of the OTU. One thing that though you'll need to um, oh sorry so OTUs yeah and the other thing is that there are probably areas of the 16S sequence the very region that you're amplifying that um, are going to be more or less variable between uh, so you, you're going to want to once you design your primers um, for that subsection um, check it to make sure that that bit of the representative sequence that you choose is going to be just as discriminative as the longer sequence. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so with the cost of sequencing decreasing, I was wondering if, you know, if we have to keep worrying about making, finding biomarkers and developing PCR primers, or if we should just do the 16S analysis or even the metagenomics, the cost is going to be like less than $100 for metagenomics and 16S is already almost the same price as QPCR. Yeah, I think um, it really comes down to uh, 
depends what your use is, right? I mean, if you're doing sort of research-based analyses, I absolutely think, you know, it's going to make a lot of sense just to do, you know, 16 ounce analysis because you get more data, right? But, um, uh, you know, one of the worries I always have, you know, with places like the BCCC and National Microbiology Labs and everything, I, I appreciate the, the benefit of moving from culture-based to PCR-based diagnostics, but it always scares me a little bit because, you know, as somebody who used to work in... Um, the national lab for what was called STDs at the time, and um, you know that you just sort of these these bacteria are evolving, and they can sort of um, uh, there can be impre impressively strong selection to not be detected because if you're not detected as a sexually transmitted disease, and you can spread more because people don't tend to, and also as a little aside, you can actually be if you're sub like not that bothersome a disease and people won't go to get treatment so there's a there's some interesting selections that occur there but uh, so there's a bit of a worry that um, you know with PCR you're sort of focusing on a certain region and I just want to emphasize first that cautionary note to really validate well you know you could find something and it looks all exciting but maybe have a good pile in your back pocket of other things you're going to validate too because some of them will not work out in the end but but I have to say for the sort of clinical diagnostics, I mean, the PCR-based approach is certainly preferred from, um, I, I don't know if you would have a comment, but just from a legal approval policy framework, they just, they, they really prefer, you know, a lot of um, organizations, including Environmental Protection Agency and stuff, coming up with tests. They prefer see things where it's very definitive, you know, what that test is. And so they have trouble with this sort of concept of metagenomics. I think that might change over time. But uh, there's also a noise level, you know, in metagenomics, right? Uh, well, we have to develop an algorithm that would give you a definitive yes or no, right? Mm -hmm. With cutoffs. Yeah. And but that's just flipping it from sort of analytical to Yes, but uh, you know, I think it comes down to um, in the end cost. You know, like uh, PCR is pretty darn cheap. You know, I mean, it's like less than a buck, isn't it? Now I don't know. I can't remember what the you know a sample, and that's really powerful. If 16s amplicon analysis can be maintain its competitiveness, that's fine. Metagenomics, I think that'll always uh, uh, for now, at least, that will remain something that will not be part of a diagnostic just because it's just the cost is, unless you can really show that there's huge value in it. But I do appreciate that, for example, at the metagenomic sample, I mean, you can basically have that panel that in silico, right, you can find those markers, right? But you could argue if you're going to find those markers and you can get primers, then you can just put it into existing um, pipelines for you know, these big banks of PCR machines, you know, it's sort of easy to implement in these large scale environments, you know, I mean, getting back to what they call now sexually transmitted infections or STIs, I mean, that's, I think, the number one test that's done at the BC Center for Disease Control, if I remember correctly, you know, it's a really popular, you know, like many, many samples being processed all the time. So having that real cost effectiveness and having that infrastructure there is, is really key. And, um, but I have to say, uh, another area I think is really interesting is in environment. Um, it's not always about, you know, um, it, you know, sometimes there's this issue, you know, with biomarkers of, uh, you know, really wanting to track how things are changing over time. Like, for example, in environmental assessment uh, situation where the advantage of metagenomics is you can detect how things are changing and new things might be coming up that you would miss in a PCR-based uh, uh, test. But I think in short, you know, things are going to be moving and it's going to be important to always keep on top of how things are changing and adapting. Uh, you know, I, don't, I think we haven't, you haven't talked really about long read sequencing and how that could transform a lot of metagenomics um, in the future uh, with basically getting better quality um, analyses of your metagenome community uh, through long reads and you know that I would say is more like you know five years away to really good quality data but is something to absolutely keep your eye on what's happening in, in that area yeah. and um, uh, I just wanted to bring up a couple things uh, also now we have um, 
you know, okay, first there's, there's, there's two main things I wanted to see if you guys wanted to discuss at all was one, if you had particular, uh, research questions, um, you know, one thing is don't hesitate to bring up some challenges or things that you're interested in analyzing because we can sort of use it as a bit of case study and give you feedback on it and use this as an opportunity to sort of bring some things together. Uh, so if you have something you want to bring up, uh, you know, now's a good time. Uh, the other thing is just to get feedback on the course. We're going to be doing a survey um, uh, after this. But it's sometimes nice just to get sort of general comments that people have about the course, things they wish were covered more, things that they wish were covered less, things that they liked about it, things they found confusing. Um, so if you have any comments um, also about the course too, it's uh, really appreciated at this stage. So does anybody have any thoughts that just come to their mind right away that are like, oh, you know, I'd be great if this was covered. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, just want to say thanks A lot of information in three days, and I feel like I kind of get it. But then when I go back and try and do it, it's nice to have the, all the lectures to go back to and the practice data sets like from the labs. I think yeah. that's really, really helpful. So we looked at the this year. Last year we did a AP community at every part. Everyone could have a community login. Um, but that meant that if you went home and you forgot your login or you wanted to share that information with your lab, um, they wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for that. And um, it's a big struggle with with workshops of this length of how much material. I mean, we could bombard you with insane amounts of material, but we could also go too light. So it's really good to get a feel for if we're getting a good balance. Uh, and it's definitely not unusual to feel like, you know, like, that's a bunch of stuff. But uh, but that's the point, is you do have access to this material afterwards to digest it. And I also encourage you, you know, other Canadian Bioinformatics workshops, they also have a lot of material posted. So if there's some other analysis you're interested in, like doing statistics with R, I think there is one. There is the genic, there's two R ones. And of course, she is the one to ask <laughs> to find out about uh, all the workshops going on. So, you know, if you're interested in gene expression and stuff like that, so just, and there's a lot of material that's posted there, uh, you know, to check out. And, you know, um, I think that's a really good resource too to appreciate. Yeah. Okay, any other thoughts on, in particular, is there anything that you would have liked to have had covered uh, more? Uh, is there anything that was sort of missing a little bit? Um, uh, or bits where you would have liked more depth, you know? Would you have liked to know more about a particular method or anything like that? Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, make sure you put that in the survey. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then, um, uh, what was the other thing I was going to ask about? Uh, just also the timing. Um, can I do a little bit of a little like pull, like uh, Choi hands, did you find it was like uh, sort of um, uh, a little too fast going through things at all at times or was, yeah, sometimes I see a few nods, okay, a few hands. And or did you find that sometimes it was like maybe a bit too slow? Was it like a little bit too, no? Okay, that's notable, yeah. I feel like some people have like a very beginner's level of computing and then some are more advanced.
that's it. I really like the wolf text because that, again, I'm program 19, 19, I can't forget. Sorry, I'm talking against that. But the text I found really useful because I felt like it was kind of told what was going on. So I found that really Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you're hitting on a classic issue of in bioinformatics. I mean it's bio and informatics and you've got these people with different computational backgrounds and biology backgrounds and that's always a challenge. Uh, you know, even teaching it in undergrad class, you know, you'll get these students who have a lot of experience. I usually have labs where I have the, you know, uh, the initial sort of Unix training lab for my class in the molecular biology department uh, where I'm like, okay, here's the whole long version, but if you already know Unix, here's the really short version. If you can do this and this and this, you're done and <laughs> out of here, you know. So it's, uh, it, but it is a big challenge that and, but I, I, I want to emphasize a couple things is, you know, as you move forward in research um, in any kind of environment, uh, the team-based approach can be so valuable. I mean, this kind of stuff, it, it really pays to have somebody with a more, you know, in-depth understanding of you know, microbiology and microbiomes and somebody who's got more in-depth understanding of, of, um, of bioinformatics and uh, or statistical methods and just a, if you can, you know, draw upon these different people and get the, those expertises involved in your analysis, it can, you know, huge payoff um, and get those ideas from other fields. I mean, we've had a lot of success in just getting people who are doing machine learning to apply some methods to our uh, problem, our biological problem, it develops some really interesting new insights by using their machine learning methods. There's a lot of computer scientists out there who got, have these cool ideas of great new computational approaches and they don't have data to, to apply them to and they're usually really happy uh, to work with you and uh, try to work on um, uh, some problems. Sometimes it doesn't quite work out, sometimes the analysis is so simple that it's not so interesting, but sometimes it can be really uh, a really big payoff. So. And getting statistical experience, like, make sure your stats are good. I, I regretted not taking more statistics when I was <laughs> in school. Yeah. yeah. So now that the course is done, is there anything that um, the PhD students or the lecturers would recommend to continue um, improving coding programming skills? That's a great idea. I'm actually going to ask. Um, do a little, maybe we could go through and do a few quick thoughts of everybody has, you know, on, uh, you know, like for me, I have to say, um, an issue is deciding where you want to be on that spectrum of computational and bioinformatics, you know, how much do you want to be developing software or, or developing algorithms and how much do you want to be doing analyses, uh, uh, but so you want to sort of think about what your interests are, uh, but, um, uh, but certainly if it's, uh, I don't know what your background is, so it's hard to say, like if you don't have a CS degree, I'm assuming. No, I don't. So you have like just, so a biological sciences degree or something like that, yeah. So I mean, um, there, I'm going to mention something, but you guys might have other ideas, is, uh, you know, it depends on, if you really want to get into it, I would say uh, you can go for it and take a few courses, but then you should take a few courses and get some decent CS training if you really want to take it seriously. Uh, you know, doing a sort of a minor, you know, or something like that can be useful. But uh, but if you're really wanting to get into it more in a sort of casual way, uh, you know, there's certain texts and just diving in and doing some stuff, learning some programming yourself, you know, it also can be very successful, but I'd actually be very curious to see what you guys say. But, uh, but I, I will add to this that I think also, um, a, I don't know what the demographics of it, can I just get a, actually a show of hands, how many people have like CS degrees? Does anybody have a CS degree? You do? Okay. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so how many people have biological sciences degrees? Okay, so does anybody have another degree? Yeah, what do you have? Okay, so this is actually almost exactly like a bioinformatics class I teach. You know, it's usually get somebody with a physics is really common, and. Um, uh, so uh, you guys are really at that interface then of uh, 
probably it's more an issue of computing skills, but I just want to encourage you um, to not forget about um, statistics and um, not forget about um, uh, making sure you know the biology of these organisms and appreciate some of the biology if you're from a biological sciences degree that doesn't have a lot of microbiology in it. So it's just another um, comment. But I can add some more later. But do you want? To, do you have any comments about what you think uh, or anything to add? Uh, I would just say that it, it does take a while to get used to command line uh, pro and uh, executing your your um, tool through command line because you know most of us grow up with using Windows, which is a, a graphic interface, and then now. But that's not very scalable for, for the type of analysis we want to do. So eventually you have to revert back to command line based approach that people in the 80s, 70s are uh, quite familiar with and have no problem using. Um, and I do find that everyone eventually can pick up command line and can, can eventually be proficient with it. Average is probably at least two, three months of full time or about six months of sort of fairly intensive use. So, Three days is definitely not enough, and don't give up just yet. But if six months of intensive use, you still hate the command line, then you really have to think about where you position yourself in that spectrum. Right? You don't want to torture yourself for the rest of your life. You don't, if you don't like programming at all. But the trick there then is you have to be able to collaborate with someone who will have the money to pay for someone to do that. I wonder where I'm going to I'd really like to ask Amanda as well. If you could name one annual conference or meeting you go to So what do you say? I'm going to wait till the end of that. <laughs> uh, for my profile? So I don't go to either of those too often nowadays, but uh, well, I mean the big bounce my conference would be the, uh, the ISMB conference. That's probably the largest bioinformatics conference and there will be analysis of all sorts. There's usually thousands of people there and a typical Bound my conference, the smallest scale one would be in the hundreds only, so that's the largest one. And it's usually in combination with, uh, with other large conferences, so you get a couple of big conferences joining force. And it's an international one, which usually tend to be at fairly good locations, so it's an added bonus. Morgan's favorite is Lake Airhead. Yes. That's what I that was that was top on my list. The Lake Arrowhead microbial <laughs> genomics meeting is just awesome. I I just I can't rave about that enough. It's uh it's really cute though how it's run, you know. Jeff, you just sort of send him your check, email him. I'd like to go, you know. You just email him a check or send him a check. And uh but uh but it's just it's it's increasingly become microbial focused and it's a really like the meeting that a lot of people who were some leaders in the area will take the time to go to and travel and they will come from overseas to go to where there's a lot of people who won't come from the UK over to here. <laughs> Sorry, it's painful as I talk about people from UK traveling right now. <sighs> but um, but I have to say the um, this concept of just that people value that meeting so much. So, so what's called microbial geology? Microbial genomics and we could send a like a, a link to it. It's only every it's two years after. Yeah. It's just only at, yeah, Lake Arrowhead every other year. For conferences, uh, IHMC, the International Human Microbiome Consortium, is at Baylor College just this year. So it's a really big one if you're in the microbiome. Uh, and then ISME is in Montreal in uh, August this year, so it's microbial ecology. It's increasingly covering human Besides that, there's some usually some cool T-cell and blood conferences, but you have to sort of see what the topic is. Maybe more environmental or you know, just like focused. Those are all good. Do you have any thoughts? What would you say to somebody who's more I mean it does seem like there's I'm gonna comment on this to Peter Scientist too, but for the About the Peter Science. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think you know there's the parts we've covered here, so hopefully you have the Basics to get through to you know do what I would consider the maybe the minimal or actually the acceptable amount of work to get to the thing where you can start to interpret your data. But I think 
it's pretty apparent that when you talk to each of you that you have sort of tailored needs of what you want to go after, right? And so that requires probably sometimes just hacking away or trying to piece together other tools or products, right? To be like, well, that's great, I have this profile and, and I can talk about all these things, but I'm really interested in stage or I'm really interested in one of the particular piece uh, functions and maybe doing phylogenetic trees or I'm really interested in how these things interact or something. And so some of those have tools and some of them just don't and you sort of have to figure out how to split the app yourself. But at least I think what you've learned here and if you've mastered later on, you'll have the, the basics of getting the you know the first pass of your data. And uh, so to add, a, add to that a little bit is if if you see something stand right out, then it's great. And then sometimes when nothing stands out, you're like, oh, what do I do now? So I think the one thing that's not covered much uh, is probably machine learning, uh, which was mentioned by Jim a little bit. It's something that we're increasingly using in our lab uh, quite a bit uh, to try to tease out you know, whether we can truly classify samples. But also, it's, it's interesting for both classifying samples, which is really useful, but also trying to find um, what things are most important. That requires some more learning, <laughs> um, but it's something that if you're really interested in sort of diving into the data a bit more, it's really cool uh, technology, and there's packages that are making it easier and easier to do scikit-learn, the way you can actually learn a quick web page as a Python package. It requires a little bit of time, but if you want to do it, so it's one thing that you want to dive deep into that is, that's, that's really cool. Um, do you guys want to add some comments? We only have yeah. about like five more minutes, so okay. yeah. Well, I think we have five more minutes till the survey thing, don't we? Or no? Yeah. Okay. I just want to encourage people to still do the survey because that's easy. Yeah. Okay. Oh, great one. Um, so if you're interested in learning some more computational skills, um, these are usually two good workshops that either focus on R or Python, and they include some command line skills and how to use Git. And um, it's very hands-on. You sort of program along with the instructor for two days. Uh, and they're typically either free or fairly low cost. Um, so I would just Google software carpentry. Um, those are the ones that do more the R and Python. And data carpentry is more focused on data analysis, uh, but and probably if, like Phil, you know, what Morgan was talking about, if you want to do sort of like and learn stuff through Python, or you have some um, requirement to really fiddle with your data uh, beyond what we've been able to do in the last couple of days, um, I think taking one of those software carpentry workshops would be really beneficial for learning new skills. Thank you so much for mentioning that, because that's probably like one of the yeah top recommendations I have. Yeah. Um, Mike, Mike, do you have anything to add, or I mean, yeah, you'll get? It depends what you want to do, and it's, you just have to practice doing stuff. There's so much information on the internet, and like just googling, like fact exchange and all that. Um, or if you want to take like a more course-based thing, like the software carpentry is great, and also there's just like online courses or just on people who make websites with you know going through learning pretty much any. Except for certain, you know, except for probably a lot fewer of that because it's so specialized, but anything like machine learning or any programming language, any command line, there's so many different ways to do it. I think there's Coursera, and Coursera, and Microsoft. Yeah, yeah, there's also Coursera online. Microsoft Python Coursera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Knight is going to do a microbiome yeah, Coursera and like starting in sometime in June, end of June, September, oh, July. Great. So, yeah. Wow, that's great. That. That's awesome. Okay. Um, do you have any thoughts you want to add? I mean, I've mentioned a lot. Well, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you have a problem, something gives you a book, you have to program it to see, and you just get down and do it. So <laughs> it's, uh, you know, if you have a need for something, then that really drives you to learn it. I think that to me is kind of key. It's, you know, you've got to do something, so that forces you to learn. Something yeah. Like that, and that's more useful. You know, if, if there isn't a solution out there, well, you will want doing it, don't you? And yeah. in terms of competencies, I think that's what I think because we had the first Canadian competition conference just a few weeks ago, and so we'll be hosting 
this again, I think it's over in Vancouver. Yeah, and literally, if you're interested in bioinformatics and interested in volunteering to help with that, and you're in BC, you know, <laughs> that's uh, something to consider. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think in general it's challenging in the research area. I mean, it's just, it's a huge challenge. And we, you have to remember that you're always, like, when you classify into actual species or genera or genes, there's this whole pile of organisms and genes you're missing because they aren't known or aren't studied yet or you know there's all these hypothetical genes right and so just you always have to remember you're dealing with this very subset of knowledge that we have of the true diversity and uh, but you know uh, there's huge opportunities here though as we move forward I think to you know get organized and get better uh, better data but uh, yeah you do have to be really careful and I'm going to add one other point that I wanted to mention, um, just about the importance of just being careful with your analyses. You know, that garbage in, garbage out, it's just easily, easy to come up with. These are these taxa that are there, and you don't really have any sort of, without the controls, you know, in particular, but, you know, even with the controls, sort of really hard to say those taxa, you know, like, you just it's just, uh, you can easily get some garbage come out. And so I wanted to bring, I'm trying to remember, so... We, we're de without bringing up very much, we're dealing with an issue right now of s uh, somebody who did analysis where they made some big errors and it resulted in some wrong taxa being produced, you know. But I'm trying to remember, do you remember way back when in the Watershed Project we had a problem also? And I can't remember what it was. What was that one? Because I just wondered if it would be nice to share these kinds of things to think about, to watch out for, because I would hate to see some peop other people make these mistakes. And what was that one about the primers? Or I can't so, yeah, so the first time we did some high sync sequencing, our uh, libraries were too short. They were, um, so our the sequencing libraries were very, very short. They were shorter than our reads. Um, and so what uh, happened was for, I don't know, say 70% of the reads, I guess, we had the last 30 base pairs being all A's. That was strange. Uh, and we were all <laughs> realized that, right, if we had just, you know, triple quality and then toss it into negative and never looked at our data, we would, you know, we'd get answers. We would have gotten, uh, you know, a taxonomic table and a gene function table, and we would have never been the wiser if we didn't look at the data or and look at those fast PC plots and notice that, oh, look, the frequency of A is really high at the end. What's with that? So um, it's really, really important to always, you know, just open your files, take a quick look at them, make sure they don't look crazy. Uh, and really something I've been noticing is paying attention to the size of your reads versus the size of your binaries, whether you're doing anthropon analysis or chocolate analysis, um, seems to be a common uh, problem in, in sequencing that I've, that I've seen. So that's something to, to make sure you're on top of it, I guess, and, and look at your data. Always yeah, yeah. And even doing things like, uh, you know, um, what was that thing that, uh, you know, something as simple as seeing if the, you know, sequence composition on the sort of merged reads you're analyzing is similar to the sequence composition of your entire data set and stuff like that. You know, like just do these checks and, you know, just, it, it, you know, genomics and particularly, I think, microbial analysis can be quite dangerous in that fact that you can sort of easily go down this road of not getting stuff. That, so, you know, see if your data makes sense, too. See, are you getting sort of some of the, the big tax that you expect for, you know, a, a given type of analysis, you know? And if you have outliers, you know, what's going on with those outliers? So uh, it's all common sense, but still, it's important to appreciate. But, but I have to say, uh, this issue of the 
microbiology knowledge. I mean, I come back to you and say, you know, like you want to get talking to somebody who has more microbiology knowledge and look at your data. You know, we, we, we come up with data and then, you know, if you can get people to just, um, I, I did all this stuff way back when, okay, see, wait, we have to finish. Um, I did all this analysis way back when where I was, um, uh, dealing with taking, um, and, and doing, I did a bioinformatics undergrad where a, a, a bio, biochemistry undergrad where I had to take all these metabolism courses and they were so horribly dry and boring and meta memorizing all these metabolic pathways and everything and it was like horrible but it's been so valuable because I can look at data and I know those pathways and I can sort of see trends you know and um, so just but getting somebody to look at your data sometimes they can see some things that uh, you know you can't and appreciating these biases you know this these biases like you know keg or or whatever. I mean, they've classified things into pathways, but those pathways, you can have sub pathways, you can have mega pathways, and you know, it'll only find the stuff based on how it's classified. And it depends how you classify what you're going to find. So just got to keep that in mind. Anyways, I think we have to stop there. Hopefully, those comments have been useful. But as you mentioned, we can do more comments afterwards.